one of the most important ways or reasons why strength training is so effective for fat loss and longevity. And that is that it's the only form of exercise that will reliably, if done properly, will reliably teach your body to burn more calories on its own. Like if there was one thing that I could do to solve the obesity epidemic mm -hmm. that was really effective, it would be boost everybody's metabolism by 50%. We would solve obesity uh, right out the gate. What's up, y'all? Here's the giveaway for today. MAPS Resistance. This is a phenomenal beginner strength training routine. We're going to give that away for free because this entire episode is about resistance training and why it's the most effective way to work out when it comes to fat loss and longevity. So here's how you can win that program. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Uh, subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications, do all those things, and if we like your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to MAPS Resistance. Now, everyone else, because this program is all about resistance training, or I should say this episode is all about resistance training, that program is 50% off with this episode only, so it's a very short period of time. So if you want to get the program and get it discounted, go to mapsresistance.com and then use the code RESIST50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, look, here's the deal. When it comes to fat loss and health, nothing beats resistance training. It's actually the best form of exercise when you compare it to other forms of exercise head-to-head -head when it comes to those two things, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Do you think that we haven't beat this drum enough? We need to beat it more. <laughs> I feel like we need beat a it down. bigger drum. I, I, no, I, you know, when I, just when I think that we, we, we should lay off of this, it, it never surprised, ceases to surprise me, somebody messaging that, that they're still trying to run the body fat off yeah, you know what's using weight training. Totally. And you know yeah. what's great is that, because um, we've been doing this for a long time, and when you you obviously train people for a long time and you you really care about them, you start to figure this out because you see what works, what doesn't work, uh, considering how many times a week people want to work out and what their goals are and what works long term. But what was frustrating for years, and I'm sure you guys were like this, was that the medical community and the scientific community they, they, they weren't up to speed. Like all the studies on health mm -hmm. and longevity, maybe not now. So over the last 15 years, we've seen some great studies, but especially over the last 10 years. But before that, if you looked up exercise and health, it was n none of them used strength training or resistance training. They're, the only studies done on strength training or resistance training, you know, 15, 20 years ago were done on athletic performance. So if you looked at what forms of exercise help improve longevity or fat loss or blood lipids or whatever. It was always cardiovascular activity. It was almost never strength training. So we had nothing to point to. And so what people did when they thought of strength training or resistance training, they looked at bodybuilders, which is a terrible way to, to judge it because bodybuilders are extreme. Yeah, Those are extreme athletes um, doing things that are not healthy uh, to their bodies. And so it just didn't get it the credit that it deserved. But luckily today, we have lots of studies now showing just how powerful strength training is for fat loss and longevity, which, you know, those two things were never put in the same sentence with us. Uh, do you think training. that was a lack of not knowing by the medical community, or do you think that was a conscious choice because they evaluated risk versus reward and just assumed, oh, no. weight training's too risky, therefore let's point people in the direction of mm. just running because that's an easy, simpler form for them to Yeah, I think it was cultural, right? Like, to your point, like, I think it, it, culture was very much driven in the cardio vascular uh, side of things like because it was I can I can get you to get off the couch and just start moving that was like a lot easy ease of access in terms of like I didn't have to educate myself quite as extensively as I did you know now having to go into the weight training side of things and plus the only example of that really that everybody knew was bodybuilders that were pretty extreme in their efforts yeah but also imagine if you're a researcher okay and you're like let's look at exercise and how it impacts longevity you're not you're probably not a strength coach or an expert in exercise you're just a researcher so you look at all the forms of exercise you're like I'm gonna pick uh, let's have these 30 participants run or bike. You have them do strength training. Well, you need access to equipment. You got to know how to do strength training. There's a million and one different ways to do it. And if you're doing an animal study, good luck. It's easy putting a hamster in a hamster mm -hmm. wheel 
have a hamster do something that simulates strength training. You got to have, it's a much more complex study and test. And also nobody thought to go in that direction mm -hmm. because exercise for a long time had always been, like fitness had always been um, compared to like stamina, mm -hmm. right? So like how long you can endure. Yeah, was being we, in shape was really like what everybody desired. Yeah, so it wasn't, it was just that. That's all it was um, until researchers started to really look at, well, let's look at this other, for, let's look at all these other forms of exercise and see how they impact our health. And so the thing is, when you're in a, 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 a particular field and you have experts in that field, they often will tell you, hey, here's what we're seeing. But the science usually takes a decade or two uh, to follow. When was when when was Jack LaLanne most popular? Was it the 60s, 70s? Obviously, all the way. I know through oh, the yeah. 80s. But when did, when did he become really popular? Oh, he was, was it as far back as the 60s. Yeah, yeah, 60, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, a long time. Okay, long time. I think it was 60s. Yeah, where it was his like the real pinnacle of his fame. I, I would I would think because because he's probably the single most impactful person when it comes to connecting strength training to health because totally. up until that point and even even around that time and, and even afterwards you know strength training was connected to bodybuilding and bodybuilding wasn't thought of as healthy it mm -hmm. wasn't thought of as like oh these people are in pursuit of ultimate health mm -hmm. they were more the people that were into sculpting a physique and looking a certain way and being impressive it wasn't like oh these guys are in are the some of the healthiest people out there it really wasn't yeah no and even then that. even then if popular media um like movies that's what people see right jack lane was kind of well known he had this popular tv show where he would teach people to do exercises and he would just use a chair so I don't know if you guys have ever seen these videos. Oh He's my wearing God. like, have you seen his warm ups? That was my favorite. Yeah. With him like and his toes, wife, his like, fingers. Yeah, hands, and he'd have yeah. like these little, almost look like ballet slippers, and he'd do like leg lifts, and you know, and he would do, you do kind of like body weight type strengthening stuff. Um, but popular media was if you saw anybody that did strength training, it was the it was the beach those B movies, those beach B movies, and they were dumb narcissistic, yeah, muscle bound, you know, which obviously we know that's baloney bodybuilders who were super, you know, infatuated with their own bodies. They look in the mirror, they're stupid. And so yeah. people never connected strength training to health. Um, and then you had pumping iron, which that was a documentary that kind of went mainstream, but that was about bodybuilding. Still about the way you look. Yeah. And it was about yeah. bodybuilding yeah. and it's extreme. Like yeah. you see Arnold and, and Lou, Lou, especially back then. And people are like, wow, that's extreme. And that's crazy. I don't want to look like that. You know, that's uh, that's not. And also, is that healthy? Yeah. I don't know. Well, plus, I mean, we were inundated with information that heart health was like the most important thing. And to, to, to immediately address heart health, we assume like cardiovascular training was the best option for that. And like everything, even with our diet was focused around heart health and it was like lowering uh, the, the fat intake and like low fat was like you know, the, the direction we were supposed Which was to go. Well, what, totally what year was it when we, we really started to see the studies come forward about resistance training in, in connection to your metabolism? Oh boy. It was uh, that, I mean, that's more recent. Um, uh, the, the more re the more recent studies on strength training and, and health have happened in the last 10 years. Yeah. Before that, you really didn't see too many at all. And we're seeing more and more coming out now. And you did talk about, um, one of the most important ways or reasons why strength training is so effective for fat loss and longevity. And that is that it's the only form of exercise that will reliably, if done properly, will reliably teach your body to burn more calories on its own. Like if there was one thing that I could do to solve the obesity epidemic mm -hmm. that was really effective, if I could snap my fingers um, like Thanos and had some kind of, you know, the glove or whatever, make something happen, it would be boost everybody's metabolism by 50%. We would solve obesity uh, right out the gates and lots of health issues associated with that. Um, now, why is metabolism such an important thing to try to boost? Because once you boost it, it doesn't require you to move or do activity in order to, to burn those calories. This makes it a very sustainable, you know, for lack of a better term, convenient way to burn body fat, especially look, the bottom line is it would be great if we could get the average American to, you know, have an hour or more of activity every day. Not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. They're not fitness enthusiasts. They're the average person. And for them, exercise isn't their favorite thing in the world. It's just a tool that'll improve the quality of their life. Uh, and if it's done right, it'll do so. If it's done wrong, it won't. And then they stop. So what we want to do is we want to, we want to pick a form of exercise that can 
make your metabolism burn more calories so that you don't have to spend tons of time trying to burn calories, which by the way, trying to burn calories, your body adapts to that eventually anyway. And you, you end up getting no, you still have some health effects, but you, the calorie burning effects start to flatten out quite a bit. That's why you see people plateau so hard with that approach uh, with fat loss. My six-year-old aunt is experiencing this right now. She's uh, the one that is married to my uncle who works for the company, ironically. And I've been telling her this message like since I've been in training, you know, 20 years, right? So I've been telling her this forever and she's, you know, fallen into the, you know, jazzercise type of training or the mm -hmm. cardio for exercise. And she called me the other day. I think I told you guys this about my son going into surgery just to check up on him and stuff like that. And she goes, oh, I've been meaning to tell you too. I finally have listened to what you said about just focusing on strength training. I cut out trying to do any sort of crazy cardio. I'm targeting my protein and all I'm doing is I'm following this, this resistance training program, ironically, not one of ours, uh, four times, you know, <laughs> which is really funny, right? Yeah, so, yeah. well, that's whatever. That's Typical. The the, you're, you're, lifting with, family, yeah, you're lifting it, weights. I don't give a shit that you're thing. not yeah. using the programs you could have for free, right? So yeah, yeah. whatever, you know, so she's lifting weight, but what she's tripping out on is she's like, and she's been consistent now for about four months. She's like, you know, it's so crazy out of my... I went to Kansas City back to see her family. And you know there, you know me, I like to drink my wine and there's nothing but barbecue there. So we're eating out. And she goes, I do this trip every couple months. It's very, to go back and see my family. And I typically eat and do whatever I want and then come back. She goes, and every time I come back, I come back with, you know, 15, 10, 15 pounds I put on myself. She goes, I came back and the scale would literally move like one pound. Yeah. And she goes, and I did like the same wow. behaviors as I've always done. I said, this is what I've been trying to explain to you forever. What you end up doing in the past is but get ready for a trip like that. You run on the treadmill, you restrict calories, you get a little lean, getting ready to go into that. But then you've also slowed your metabolism down. So now your body cannot eat as many calories as you could if you would have actually not done that and instead tried to increase calories and build strength and then head to that trip. So basically you just, you gave yourself more room and flexibility. This is what I've been trying to tell you what metabolic flexibility is all about. And you now have it and you're supposed to like, yeah, no, it's amazing. I'm like, yeah, it's yeah, 20 not, years not later. to mention if the value of your exercise is in the calorie burn that you get from when you do it, the second you stop it, you lose the value. Yeah. If the value of your exercise is in the adaptation, right? Then you don't lose that value when you stop. It takes a lot longer to lose that value. Your body would have to adapt in the other direction, which takes a lot longer. Then you stop doing your cardio, calories are done. Mm -hmm. You stop lifting weights or doing strength training, that muscle sticks around for a long time. But you know, there are people that will argue, you know, I've seen studies that show that one pound of muscle only burns an extra 10 calories. Well, first Such of an all, annoying argument. First of all, mm -hmm. um, that's not nothing. You gain five pounds of muscle, you're burning 50 more calories a day. Do the math over the course of a year. That's how people become obese. People don't become obese by gaining 20 pounds in a month. It's usually 20 pounds over the course of two or three years. So that's not nothing. However, there's more to the story than that. You have, an, you have a, a range of calories that you can burn with the same lean body mass that you have. In other words, your body can become more or less efficient with calories with the same lean body mass. What makes you more or less efficient? Well, the signals you send your body, how you feed your body. And if I'm telling my body to prioritize strength and muscle and I feed my body appropriately, it tips the scale to less efficient with calories. It's more likely to burn more calories. So the metabolism boost that I see with clients when they do everything right and they gain five pounds of muscle is not 50 more calories a day. It's more like 500 calories yeah. more a day or more, which would take you an hour and a half of cardio or two hours of cardio just to burn. So, and no other form of exercise does this. Nothing else will boost your metabolism like strength training. So, this is one of the biggest uh, benefits of it. Right. And when you uh, recomp recomposition, I don't know the word for that, but like when yeah. you, when you go through and you, um, you acquire more muscle and, and, and replace, you know, your fat with muscle, it, it promotes more movement. So you're, you're more prone to want to actually go out and be more active and, and do things as well. Well, that's, that's, that's all like a, that's the behavioral aspect yeah. that nobody talks about also that happens, which I bring up on the show all the time. It's like, I always notice that when I'm lifting and training consistently. More energy. Yeah. I have more energy throughout my day yeah. and I'm just more productive and it's, it's not, downstream effect it's all. neat it's not exercise that you would count it's just i'm more likely to get up and help katrina with cleaning the house i'm more likely to get up and wrestle around and play with my son versus oh when i have i'm not exercising i'm not strength training i'm not eating well i feel lethargic i feel lazy i come home i just want to sit down on the couch because i feel tired it's like 
you, those studies don't account for that because they're they're just trying to measure like oh fat burns this much calorie or uh, mm -hmm. muscle burns this much therefore it's only this valuable and, and, it's like and, no there's other downstream effects that you get from okay someone might be wondering well doesn't other forms of exercise give you energy too yes if you improve your health however we're talking about metabolism when yeah. your body becomes less efficient with calories part of the re the way that it does it is it provides more energy to be burned yeah. So you do get more energy. You also generate more heat. People who, who lift weights or do strength training notice that their body feels warmer mm -hmm. because your body burns more calories just through heating itself up. If your body's trying to become more efficient and burn less calories, it'll reduce your energy so you try to move more less. And you'll also notice that you have less tolerance to cold because you already feel kind of cold. All right, here's the next one. And and this is a this is supremely unique to strength training. Primarily because strength training has such a variety of, there's no, like name one form of exercise that has the variety of exercises or movements that strength training has, right? You can't find one that competes. That means that strength training or resistance training allows you to target, sculpt, and strengthen your body, okay? So if I run, I'm using my legs a lot. Right? If I cycle, I'm using my legs a lot. If I swim, I'm using my whole body a lot, but I'm using it in this very repetitive kind of motion. If I play any sport, there's this kind of repetitive type of, you know, if I see someone run, cycle, swim, I can tell simply by looking at their movement. With strength training, I can say, I want to develop more of my glutes. I can say, I want to sculpt my shoulders to look a particular way. I can say, I want to work more on my midsection and build and sculpt that way. It's this, and it's, of course, there's nothing like this, but it's as close as you can get to being a sculptor. Like imagine if your body was a, a piece of clay and you take some off here and build some there and really sculpt and shape your body. What a wonderful attribute of, a, of, of, a, of this form of exercise. Yeah, well, a lot of pain uh, we've found is, is related to weakness. So weakness in, in, in your support system and to be able to identify areas of your body to strengthen, um, you know, resistance training is the most appropriate way to train to address a lot of these things. So that way too, now your, your body is, is more resilient, more, um, you know, supported in its, in its movement patterns, which then reduces the amount of pain you're going to experience. Well, and I know it may sound superficial, but also the, when we look at a body that we're, you know, attracted to a lot of the formula that goes into that is symmetry mm -hmm. and balance so, yeah. Yeah, symmetry and balance and, and it's and it's it's less of like oh that person has two percent more body fat or you know you know five more pounds of muscle it's more about the balance and symmetry that they have in their body and that's what we tend to be attracted to and they have all kinds of stuff to support that that when we look at a person it's the the ratios of of their hips to their shoulders to their waist to things like that 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 we are drawn to and it's less about oh that person's five percent body fat therefore they're uh, attractive or oh that person has 10 more pounds of muscle therefore attractive it's that you can actually take resistance training look at your body and go like oh i'm out of balance here or i could have more shoulders or you know more glutes to your point and like have this more symmetrical physique yeah you could target uh what you want to develop and shape and also here's your evidence right here um, rehab specialists, physical therapists, sports medicine practitioners, what form of exercise is their primary form that they use to rehab people? <clears throat> Strength training. Strength training they don't time. use other forms of exercise. Why? Because it's targeted. Why is it important for it to be targeted? Because when I'm dealing with an injury, I have to look at the individual and say, what is it that caused that injury? Or what is what did you have surgery on? What are we working on? They don't use general forms of exercise. So Strength training is extremely specific, and then back to the you know the aesthetic aspect of it. Look, uh, I'm not gonna. I mean, we can't gloss over this. One of the main motivators for people working out is they want to look good. Yeah. Well, okay, you could work out and generally look better, or what if you could look better but also have a say in what parts of your body right. you change the most? Like, tell me one form of exercise I can go and say I want, you know, more developed upper chest. And I want a better, more sculpted lower back and hamstrings. Like, what activities? I'd have to like create a, a weird type of movement pattern to do that, or I could just go do some strength training, pick specific exercises, place more focus on those areas, and then boom, I shape and sculpt my body. Um, I mean, I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah. All right, this next next effect, I like this one because this one really convinces people when it comes to strength training, um, and that's the hormone mm. effects. Now, I want to be clear, improving your health 
almost always will give you a better hormone profile. So no matter what you do, mm -hmm. if your health improves and you're a man with low testosterone or you're a woman with an imbalance in estrogen or progesterone, your cortisol is high when it shouldn't be, or you have insulin resistance, just improving your health, you'll see things get better, okay? But only one form of exercise directly influences your hormones to make them, uh, to, to move them in a more youthful way or to develop a more youthful hormone profile. And here's why. When I tell my body to build muscle, the way, one of the ways that it, it does so is it uses hormones. Hormones are signalers in the body. Okay. So we know what testosterone does. We know what estrogen does, progesterone, growth hormone, insulin. They have specific roles in the body. If my body says uh, or knows, hey, uh, it's time to build some muscle and some strength, what hormones are associated with more muscle and more strength? Testosterone in both men and women. By the way, testosterone is very important in women as, 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 as it is in men. Low testosterone in women causes the same side effects that you see in men. The difference is, of course, the amount, right? Just like, by the way, estrogen is important in men as well. If a man has no estrogen, health is terrible, they feel bad, just like it would be in women. They're just different ratios. But testosterone is a hormone that helps drive muscle. Um, so testosterone goes higher. What are the effects of that? Better libido, more motivation, more drive. Um, it's like a dopamine feel, like I have more energy, right? Estrogen and progesterone in women balance out. An imbalanced estrogen and progesterone ratio in women uh, makes it hard to burn body fat, makes it hard to build muscle. A balanced one is more ideal for building muscle. So then the body, it organizes estrogen and progesterone. What about insulin? Your body becomes more sensitive to insulin. A lot of people don't know this, but insulin is a, a an anabolic hormone. It's actually one of the most anabolic hormones there, there, there is around. Growth hormone, right? We hear about these uh, youth centers, right, that give people growth hormone and make them feel younger. Growth hormone is a youth hormone. You find an 18-year-old, you compare them to a 48-year-old, you see a big difference in growth hormone. Well, what makes growth hormone go up reliably? Strength training. Why? Because you're telling the body to build muscle. What about cortisol? Cortisol is a stress hormone. A lot of people don't know this, but cortisol is not a bad hormone. It just has to be appropriate, meaning it goes up in the morning and starts to taper off at night, and it can't be too high all the time. Your body can't build muscle very well if cortisol is high all the time. So if you're sending the appropriate signal that says build muscle and strength, you're also feeding your body appropriately, your body balances out cortisol. So if you want a youthful, balanced, healthy hormone profile, and you want to use exercise as a way to do so, nothing does it more directly uh, than strength training. Do you think that's because you're almost tricking your body into thinking that it's a young body that's growing? Because you're sending a signal to adapt and grow, basically, initially. If you were lifting weights, yeah. that's the there's signal. There's still a need to grow. Right. There's a, there's this, you're sending a signal saying, hey, we need to add muscle. We need to get bigger, stronger, we need, right? So you're, you're, you're sending the signal to build, to grow. And that is the same signal that you naturally have when you're this young child that's growing into adulthood. So you think there's like a almost like a mechanism that we're like almost like you're tricking and fooling yeah, well, the body into thinking that it's still young. Well, yeah, kind of. And also, it's just your body. Remember, your body doesn't know you're in the gym uh, or you're doing push-ups in your bedroom. It just knows that there's a stress. Right. That's what I mean by that. It yeah. just think it just knows that. Hey, we need to get stronger. Yes. And we need to get stronger. Just and like it, you when you're a young child. It's not like you're well, doing anything other than it's like oh, it's you're, making you grow. Yeah. yeah muscle in general. Is just better at dealing with stress, right? Like oh. if you're in the environment of stress, your body it's promoting uh, your that signal for your body to be able to meet that demand, and and the best way to do that is to build muscle to resist. And so, like in terms of tissue in your body, like it's more optimal for you to consist more of muscle. It, it to also does it. it. It also does this. There was a study that was done. I want to say five years ago, around five years ago where they compared men and their testosterone levels and then how the men responded to strength training. And in the study, they, they, the theory was men with higher testosterone will build more muscle than men with lower testosterone. Now, everybody in the study, they didn't have dramatic testosterone ranges. So it wasn't like people were out of range. They were, you know, within range, but some were, you know, 900, you know, 1,000. Other people were 700, 600. And what they found was that the levels of testosterone had a small effect it was the androgen receptor density that had the largest effect. What is that? Those are the, the receptors that testosterone attaches to so it can do its thing. Only one form of exercise reliably increases androgen receptor density, strength training. Mm. You build a little bit of muscle, you automatically increase your androgen receptors. Meaning, even if your testosterone only goes up 10%, 
the, it, that extra testosterone at 10% is like another 30, 40% because of the androgen receptor density. It makes testosterone more effective. And again, what are the effects on? And by the way, it's not going to raise testosterone out of range like you're a bodybuilder taking anabolic steroids. If any women are watching, like, I don't want, I don't want to grow a beard or whatever. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but what you will get is a healthy high. And what does that feel like? Again, energy, libido, uh, strength. You just you just feel it's a feel good uh, hormone. It's an anabolic youthful <clears throat> hormone, just like the other ones I talked about. And again, because strength training uh, tells the body to build muscle, it's a direct way of moving your hormones to become more youthful. Now, on the flip side, if I do a form of exercise that makes me lose muscle, let's say I go like crazy long distance running, where my body's trying to pare muscle down and make me more efficient at this. <laughs> type of activity. Mm -hmm. It will also organize its hormones in a way to do so. It's hard to lose a lot of muscle when your testosterone's high. So what happens? Studies show this. Tons and tons and tons of crazy cardio, especially combined with yeah. calorie restriction, lower Lowers testosterone. Lower testosterone level. So yeah. one of my favorite things about uh, all the benefits that you're talking about right now is your next point, which is how little you have to do this. Yeah. That that's the part that I think is so appealing to people because let's be honest uh, not everybody is fitness enthusiast most people uh, do want to live a healthier fitter life but then also have many other priorities don't love going to the gym don't love exercising and sweating and pushing themselves really hard so it is literally the only form of exercise that you could do such a small amount and have such a large impact positively on your health. And most people know that it's good for them, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's just one of those things, but it's an extra step for their routine that they're just not willing to to make that leap because it seems so daunting. It seems like that well, time Which is frame. so weird. Which is so weird to me, though, because somebody will go outside and they decide they're going to get in shape and then they'll start running every day for a half hour or an hour which is exhausting and rough on the knees and you and you could take that one day of running for an hour and divide that by three three you know what what did that be 20 minute right 20 minutes yeah. my month, 20 minute sessions of lifting over and the get week better results and yeah. get Even way better, better results yeah. Way better results. Yes. Twenty minutes of lifting weights three days a week compared to that one person who goes out and runs their ass off for an hour. Yeah, you get it make a massive impact. Way more benefit. And, and here's why: it's because when you look at exercise, different forms of exercise, don't judge that their value on the calorie burn. Judge their value on the adaptations that they induce. And because strength training induces adaptations that are so favorable, which we're which we've been talking about, hormone profile speeding up the metabolism, um, and much more we'll get into, you don't need to do a lot of it. As long as you send that signal to build that strength and that muscle, you're good. So what does that mean for the average person? This is true, okay? I've trained people for over two, well, now almost uh, two and a half decades. The average person will reap all the benefits of strength training, all the amazing benefits of strength training with two days a week. I train the vast majority of my clients two days a week. Now, I do want to be clear, that doesn't mean I didn't encourage them to just increase their activity every day. That doesn't mean they didn't encourage them to eat healthier, and that doesn't mean they didn't need to eat healthier. Like all that stuff is still true, get good sleep, all that stuff. But when it came to exercise, if I had a client two days a week and then they watched, they ate relatively healthy, they got good sleep, whatever, they got great results. I couldn't, I, there isn't a form of exercise that would do that, that no. would even come close to doing that. In fact, there was a study that I just shared with you guys that showed that three, it was literally the title of it was three seconds of strength training uh, built, build strength and muscle, three seconds. Now, if you look at the study, what it is, it was a, it was a, a really intense, eccentrically, uh, eccentric contraction, meaning they held something really heavy, lowered it really slow, and that was it. And they did that once a day. These people, now that's not, you're not gonna get in great shape over time doing that or whatever. However, in that short, I think it was a three month study, 10% increase in strength. Yeah. Show me another form of exercise that you do for three seconds and get any adaptation, stretch for three seconds, run for three seconds. Are you going to get any improvements in no. performance? Strength training is such a valuable, powerful way to induce adaptations, which means you don't have to do a lot of it. What's the value of that? Well, you said it, Adam. You, the average person, look, we did the, we all became known in this area, in the Bay Area here, before we started the podcast, for being very good trainers. We got, we all had clients with great results. They stayed with us for a long time. All of us did a good job of that, and part of that formula was what? Figuring out how can I get people great results working out two or three days a week. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you? How many of your clients, what percentage of your clients turned into fitness fanatics that worked out 
yeah. four, five, six days a less week. Less than five. Yeah. Less yeah. than five percent. Yeah. It was yeah. it was two, three days a week. Strength training does that. Other forms of exercise, you'll still get some benefit, but nowhere. Well, this is near. one of the biggest disconnects that I think that we have in the fitness space is we still have these fitness enthusiasts that are we are preaching the message that speaks to them, mm -hmm. you know, yes. or that, that's centered around motivation and hard work and, you know, training every You're day. You're not doing and, enough. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And I just think that it's the wrong, if, if our real desired outcome is to reach the 80%, the majority of our population that are getting, you know, more and more obese, if that's our, if that's our real desired outcome is to help, help the majority of people then that message to me is getting lost in translation because they hear that and they think like, I don't want to do that. I would just rather enjoy their, their way they would respond. Clients would respond. I'd rather just enjoy life and then die when I'm supposed to die. Even if that means I got to die five or 10 years earlier, their, their attitude is that I don't want to work like that. I don't have a desire to look like well, that. Well, it's okay. I'm going to use an analogy. I know you'll love this one, Adam. It's like um, trying to build wealth. So I can either work more hours <laughs> and be like, work more hours, work more hours. Or I could find a way to take my money and invest it so that it grows without me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Boosting your metabolism, uh, influencing adaptations that affect your hormones in positive ways. That's like investing, allowing my body to work for me. Now, if people want to work out every day and be active and become fitness enthusiasts, oh my God, that's great. That would be a dream for me. I think that would be incredible. But the truth is most people are not going to do that. And if knowing that people will work out, if we're good, if we do a good job and we convince people and they build a good relationship to exercise and all that stuff, two or three days a week, this is the form of exercise uh, you need to pick. Now that takes us to the next one, which is, and this is really crazy. And the studies on this are phenomenal. You, when you get results from exercise, your body's adapting to that form of exercise because it's trying to make you better at that form of exercise. Okay, so it's understandable that when you stop that form of exercise, eventually your body adapts in the opposite direction, right? Because your body's only as fit or only as has as much endurance and only builds as much strength as it thinks it needs. If you sit down, if you lay in bed all day and do nothing, you'll see your body slowly wither away as your body adapts in that direction. Okay. Knowing that, one form of exercise uh, where you get the you get the results, you get the adaptations, one form of exercise has the results stick around the longest when you stop. And it's not even close. And that's strength training. Not even close. In fact, the, the, the newest study I just saw showed that young men uh, and women who lifted weights in this study built up a certain amount of strength and muscle. They had them stop working out. Do you know when they started to see strength and muscle gains? Uh, excuse me, strength and muscle loss? Hmm. After two weeks. Yeah. After two weeks off. And it was 1%. Yeah, and it, and each week you saw this one percent, and it start to accelerate after you you know the longer they went without it. Now you go build endurance, and you take a week off, and then go try running again and so see how you much you miss. start all over again. Yeah, now. you do anything, and you watch what happens to those adaptations. When it comes to strength and muscle, it sticks around. Why is this valuable? Because the average person, if they work out two or three days a week, like we said earlier, they're still going to miss. A weeks. Well, it in goes that right, year. right back to my point I made with my aunt. I mean, a lot. Of, that's a lot of people's life. They get ready. They have a trip. They're going to go for a week where they know they're going to eat and drink and have a good mm -hmm. time and stuff like that. And by her building some strength and muscle, she has built an, an insurance plan for herself for that week. If all she did was run and then she doesn't run and she goes and eats and drinks, all those extra calories end up getting stored as body fat. But because she had built her metabolism up by building muscle and she only took a week off, she really didn't take that big of a step backwards. Yes. And there, there was that other study, too, that compared uh, two groups of men where one group would work out for three weeks, then take a week off, three weeks, take a week off. The other group worked out every single week. Yeah. At the end of the sixth week, 16 week study. Same results. Same, same results. Yeah. Name one form of exercise that'll do that. Yeah. Right. Now I'm not saying, I do want to be clear, there's other values <laughs> that come from being active every single day. So I'm not saying you stop working out for two weeks and you don't lose you know any of the value. There's no, lots that, of value. That's not the point of this conversation. The point right. of the conversation right now is to highlight how beneficial and how little of work that you can do to get great results from using this form of exercise. Yes. How much more flexibility you have with that approach versus any other uh, programs out there and, or, or approaches that you can do in terms of like training your body. Like Strength training just allows so much more freedom with it. Yes. Now, here's the next point, which connects to that, which is when you do lose some of the results, Getting them back when it comes to muscle is remarkable. Something called uh, muscle memory, well documented. So if you don't believe me, just type that in. Studies on muscle memory. And what is muscle memory? It's 
I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say it takes you, let's say you're a woman and you start working out and you start doing strength training and you take it really seriously. You follow a MAPS program. So you got good workout programming. You're feeding yourself appropriately, good protein intake. You're sleeping good. Everything lined up. And over the course of a year, you gain, you know, let's say uh, 10 pounds of muscle, which would be a lot for a woman to gain in a year. But let's say she did. And she's really sculpted and her metabolism now is through the roof and she's loving life and she's leaner. And then let's say the following year something happens and she just stops. She just stops working out for three months and her diet kind of goes to crap and maybe she's not eating enough protein and who knows, right? And in those three months, she lost all 10 pounds of muscle. And then after three months, she's like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to get back into it. And she starts working out again. She'll gain that 10 pounds back in like two months. Or faster. Or, or faster. Yeah. The, the, it, it took her a year to gain it initially. But once you build it, you develop something called muscle memory. And this has to do with satellite cells and how the body, the muscles actually respond to, to building once they've already built in the first place. And it's a bit, a bit of a complicated process. But again, it's well documented. But however long it takes you to build the first, the first time, it's a fraction of that. The yeah. second or and third or fourth well, time. Well, I mean, I remember experiencing this even just by breaking my arm, right? Oh, yeah. Like being in a cast and just seeing how, uh, man, it was, it was one of those things where I just got I freaked out because I'm like, man, my arm is so small right now because it atrophied rather quickly. And then just to take the next few months and see how rapidly uh, my body was able to regain that strength and start, you know building those muscles back. It was pretty amazing. This is one of my favorite parts about actually getting old or older. Oh yeah. Is that not your point you're making is it actually compounds. So like when I fall off, say for a few months or I'm inconsistent for a while, it now, when I get back the results, I, I get back to more muscle than I've ever had at a faster rate than I ever have today than just 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I fall off the I fall off the wagon for a couple months. Yes, it, I still have muscle memory because I'd already put 10 years in of lifting and a certain amount of that comes back, but I've built exponentially more since then. So that's compounded. So now it's like well, I was explaining this to Katrina the other day. She's just like, I hate you. When we both fall off and we get back on the, our thing, it's like, I feel like you are like within a week or even a yeah. few workouts. She's like, I feel like you're already look like you're in great shape again. I'm like, what that is, is it's compounded interest of decades now of yep. lifting weights. I, 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 I was like, I wasn't like that. I said it was when I was in my early twenties, if I fell off for a little bit, I felt like I was always on the struggle to kind of get back to where I was before. But over time of under iron of lifting and lifting and slowly progressing and slowly progressing. Now when I fall out of shape, First of all, my out of shape is better than 10 years ago's good shape. And then when I decide to kick it back up and pick up the volume again and, and uh, consistency, I get back into shape yep. really, really fast. It's one of the coolest parts about being an older lifter who's been lifting for a really oh my, long time. Oh, dude, I, I know um, old, old bodybuilders and they, they weren't competitive. So they were, you know, they were natural. They didn't do the anabolic steroid route or anything like that. But these are old bodybuilders now in their 50s and 60s, members of gyms that I've managed. And I, they would come in and they would just, you just see this great muscle on them, whatever. And I'd watch their workouts and they weren't doing anything crazy. And I'd ask them like, man, how do you stay so, so muscular? I was like, well, I, dude, I've had this muscle for so long. Now that I'm older, I don't have to do very much to keep it. And yeah. if I stop, it comes back really fast. Like when I was a kid, I remember one guy in particular told me I was such a skinny kid, you know, and it was so hard to build it. He goes, but now it's like. It, the muscle's really easy to keep. And there's studies that actually show, I think like one seventh of the volume it takes to build your muscle is, is all that's required to maintain it. So it's a wonderful form of exercise as you age because the results stick around and it's easy to get them back when you lose them. Yeah. Um, which again, uh, understanding you know, modern life and understanding the average person, most people are not going to be consistent week in and week out, year in, year over year. There's things are going to happen. They're going to stop. They're going to lose some of it or whatever. But how wonderful... That the first time you gained it, as hard as it was, it's so much easier to gain it back the second time uh, when you get back to it. it. Makes it such a, again, a very sustainable uh, form of fitness. Here's the next one, and I'll, I'll tell a story just kind of illustrate uh, this next point. I had a client once that she hired me specifically because uh, she was experiencing bone loss. She was in osteopenia, and she was on the borderline between osteopenia and osteoporosis. So osteopenia is what happens before osteoporosis. Once you're in osteoporosis, it gets pretty bad. This is where the bones get so weak. And if you continue to go down that path, I mean, they get brittle, they break. And it's a, it's a terrible, terrible, um, you know, it's got really bad longevity with osteoporosis. So she hired me 
to help her build her bones back. Now, up until this point, they had her supplementing with vitamin D and calcium. She was on in, uh, I forgot the name of the drug. I want to say Fosamax, which is kind of like an autoimmune mm -hmm. type drug to help try to stop the bone loss. She was walking and hiking and it was just every year. Uh, every year she'd go get this you know, bone scan and she they would see this kind of decline. The walking and the hiking slowed it down a tiny bit in her lower extremities. Upper extremities continued to accelerate. So she came to me and she said, um, I've read, this was years ago, I've read that strength training, you know, it was great for building the bones. I said, oh, oh, nothing builds the bones like strength training because muscles anchor in bones. In fact, strength training, we could call it bone building just like we could call it muscle building, okay? Yeah. Literally, it's directly builds bone. So we did, we strength trained. And remember, she was at the time in her mid 60s, I want to say, and I trained her and I think we had like, four months before her next bone scan. So for four months, and I mean, because she was a beginner, it was basic two days a week, you know, standing squats, no way, you know, push-ups on an elevated platform, like very basic exercises you would have a 65 year old do that's never lifted weights. Anyway, she went, got a bone scan and she comes in, it was her day off. She comes in super excited, shows me the results. She goes for the first time in years, not only did we stop the bone loss, but it actually started to reverse. And she goes, my doctor would like to get on the phone with you. I got on the phone with this doctor and he's like, I'm, this is insane. He goes, you know, I have a lot of patients and none of them do strength training. He goes, this right here, is this is a big deal. And it's, I've never seen this before. Yeah, we don't talk about this benefit enough, I think, uh, between how resistance, resistance training affects not just your muscles, but also your ligaments, your tendons, your bone tissue, like everything that makes up your musculoskeletal system. And it's like, to for you to be able to apply the right amount of, of force to resist, and, and provide growth. It's going to provide growth in all those areas and reinforce the strength in all those areas so you can have that kind of able-bodied longevity that we all want. Well, this also brings us to our, our next point that I think is so important is that it's so cool is that where resistance training is extremely moldable and it, no matter what your goal or adaptation you're seeking, you can change the way you decide to resistance train. Like obviously <clears throat> she comes in to, and tells you that you're not focusing the same way you're focusing the teenage boy. Who's like, I want to put on as right. much mass as possible. Or the guy who's like, I need to lose 50 pounds of body fat as much as I, or as much as I can, as fast as I can. Like that's, what's so cool about this is although it's a, you know, similar form of exercise, there's so many different ways you can mold it based off the client. Well, okay. Okay, let's say your expertise is running and a new client walks, uh, you know, a new client comes in the door and they're a paraplegic. Sorry, we can't do running. Sorry, it's not an exercise we can do. Or someone comes in and um, one arm is half as long as the other or an amputee or whatever, you name it. Okay. Strength training, I could do with anybody. Yeah. I can do strength training literally if they can move. I can apply resistance to movement to have them build. Yeah. You can't pick a form of exercise that says individualized. And at that every way. level. Even if they can't every move, level. It, which is amazing too. I mean, I've had clients that we, we really can't do a whole lot, but guess what? We can create tension and we can yes. load the body. And so there's just, again, to that point of it being modable, like even if you have a limitation and you have an injury, like we, there's ways to work around that. It doesn't need like this whole body cardiovascular output. No. no, it's again, uh, I've trained kids. I've trained uh, paraplegics. I've trained amputees. I've trained people with all kinds of injuries and surgeries, men, women, tall, short, you know, doesn't matter, especially with free weights because free weights are free. So they, they go to the individual and bands, which I can attach anywhere and create resistance wherever I want. And it's also, again, like I said earlier, why rehab specialists, any kind of rehab you need, you go to a rehab specialist that they, they use uh, forms of resistance training. So it's, there's nothing that is as moldable as uh, this form of exercise. Well, yeah. How many times have you guys met a client? And you can meet them wherever they're at, right? So how many times have you had a client who was like an unbelievably obese and could barely move or really, really old and can barely move? And the the training was getting up and down from a chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that is a form of resistance training. And it's at the level that that person is currently at. And I can build from that. It's resistance. That person comes in, right? Mm -hmm. And I can't make them run. They can't Gravity's go hit the stair enough. master. They yeah. can't go do. They can't do some jazzercise fucking group class. Like they can't do. There's a lot of things they can't do. But we can resistance train. We can find a way to mold it to their their life, where they're currently at, and meet them there, and slowly progress them to where they can 
can eventually do like a barbell Perfect. squat or another movement. Perfect. All right, let's talk about brain health. Uh, this is a, this is something now more and more people are talking about because we're seeing rates of dementia and Alzheimer's um, kind of skyrocket, and you know Western medicine is really focused on trying to find a cure for this. Well, guess what? There's only one form of exercise, one non-medical intervention that's been shown to halt the progression of beta amyloid plaques. These are the things that we think are one of the main causes of the symptoms of Alzheimer's. In fact, uh, only one form of exercise has not only been shown to halt it, but possibly even reverse. That's strength training. There was a study done out of S Sydney, Australia, and strength it was it, it blew them away that this form of exercise actually did something that they they can't find anything else that can do. And there's medications that uh, don't, don't even operate as well as this does. Now, why is this the case? Probably because building muscle makes your body very insulin sensitive. Muscle is a, is a, is a sugar glucose thirsty tissue. And one of the most effective ways to improve insulin sensitivity is to build a little bit of muscle. Well, a lot of researchers call Alzheimer's and dementia type three diabetes. It's your brain or your body's inability to utilize insulin and process glucose properly, which can cause some of these issues. That's why when you get someone on with Alzheimer's or dementia and you put them on a ketogenic, no carbohydrate diet, you often see an improvement in, in cognitive function. Well, strength training makes the brain healthier through this process. Mm -hmm. And again, generally improving your health will be good for your brain. So I want to be clear. It's not like other forms of exercise don't help your brain. Just getting healthier will help your brain. But none of them come close to strength training in the literature that is looking at exercise well, and brain health. What's weird is, I mean, we just always think of the brain as this problem-solving machine, right? And then, like, we're sitting there and we're, we're trying to get as much input as possible to learn and to, um, you know, memory bank a lot of information or try to work our way through problems, like, cognitively. But you're doing that with your body all the time. And all of these, like, uh, signals in, in your nervous system, like, reacting and responding, this is all stimulus that keeps the brain super active it's mathematics and yeah it's it's math your mm. brain is computing at an unbelievable level and it's doing crazy math whether you think you are or not to throw a ball or to do a barbell squat the mm. the, the the mathematical complexity that the brain is having to do while doing that we make it we make it sound like it's no big deal you just grab and you throw something but the the formulas it's having to do in order yeah. to do that and then if you're not doing any of that stuff the like the like the brain or like every other part of your body it prunes it off if it doesn't need to if you yeah. don't challenge it in that way then it says oh there's no reason there's well, no there's no reason for me to use this this way because this person isn't asking asking its body to do it yeah so. no, and along those lines when you do other forms of exercise they tend to look the same and be repetitive over time so yes it has some in that aspect, brain boosting effects. However, at some point, it's the same thing over and over. I'm on a bike, I'm running, I'm walking. It's the same thing over and over again, right? Strength training, because of its variety, it's because I'm math. moving in different- it's different math every time. I'm moving in different planes. I'm rotating, I'm going laterally, I'm up and down, I'm moving horizontally with all these different exercises. You develop what's called this, this proprioceptive uh, intelligence or part of your brain. Literally knowing where your body is in space, with strength training is different than it is with other forms of exercise. Now, they all will benefit this to some extent. But again, because strength training provides so many different exercises, you know, if you run, it's always the same thing over and over again. That's right. It's like learning multiplication and just multiplication, but ignoring division or algebra, all these other things. When you are doing all those different movements you're talking about with strength training, you're having to learn all forms of mathematics. Yes. It's not just that same formula over and over and over that you got good at. You're challenging the brain in a much different way. Excellent. All right. This last one uh, is important because um, as of, I mean, I looked this up this morning and the statistics say that one out of every three of us will uh, have cancer or die of cancer in our lifetimes. That's big, right? That's 33% of us. And it's a nasty disease and they're very complex. And it's a, it oftentimes is a slow agonizing death and nobody wants cancer. Well, they've done studies to show the anti-cancer effects of exercise. Now, all forms of exercise, if they improve your health, will reduce cancer. Okay. All forms of exercise. However, none of them came close to strength training. Strength training by itself um, in the latest studies, reduced cancer risk by over a quarter. So 25% reduction in cancer just from strength training. Now, to be clear, the study showed that strength training in combination with other forms of exercise had the largest reduction in cancer. But when you do head-to-head, -head, 
Nothing, none of them came close to strength training. Now, why do I, now again, why are we talking about one form of exercise when it's probably ideal to use multiple? Because I do want to be very clear. If in a perfect world, you'd have a strength training component, you'd have a cardiovascular component, you'd have a mobility and flexibility component, you'd have a meditative component. But the reality is most people are going to work out two or three days a week. They're going to pick one form of exercise. Well, it's the same reason why you lay a foundation before you build a house. Of course, all the other shit matters, the frames, the wall, yeah. the stucco, all stuff like that. But you're going to spend the time to lay in the foundation right. first. Strength training is a foundation of health. Right. You you focus there first, and then absolutely you build the rest of it. And I think it's important to create activity and meditation and walking and going on the occasional run. I think all those things are great. But if you if you ignore resistance training and you pursue all of it, you're you're ignoring the foundation. Well, I think too. We just didn't realize the weight of it till you know recently, like the last ten years or so. Like our priorities were just off in terms of where to focus first. And I think that that's why we have to kind of highlight it a little bit more. Uh, resistance training, all the benefits, because people need to to realize like what that will do in terms of like moving the needle for them the most versus like these other forms of training. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're like, okay, I'm ready to start exercising. I'm going to improve my health. And you're looking at a list of types of exercise. You want to pick the one, you want to start with the one that's going to give you the most impact for the amount of time that you're going to be able to spend doing it. And that's strength training just across the board. And with this cancer, uh, anti-cancer effect, it's clear. I mean, nothing comes close. Part of it probably has to do with the hormone balancing effects. Part of it, there's some studies that show that the muscle building process actually re you know, releases anti-cancer chemicals in the, in the system. It actually utilizes pro-growth chemicals and way to build muscle. Um, in which case, if you if these pro growth chemicals are high and you don't have the signal to build muscle, maybe it's going to help you know go in, in fuel cancer cells. There's a lot of theories as to why, but it is very clear that strength training has the greatest anti cancer effects. And I, the argument I always make to people is this: like it's it, like you should, and should is not the same as reality or pragmatism, but you should be active every day. You should incorporate a multitude of of different exercise modalities for optimal health and longevity. But here's the reality. You're not going to. Most people aren't going to. So if we're going to pick one and then you want to add to it, that's fine. But let's pick strength training. Let's pick resistance training. That should be the cornerstone of your routine. And then if you're consistent with that, you love it and you're doing great and you want to do more. Then build on it. Now we can build upon that. Look, if you like Mind Pump, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and download some of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal.